I have to get a bigger table up here. Um, yeah, I acquired a, I usually have my nice little iPad. I like things nice and small, but I'm getting older. <laughs> and bigger is better, when, especially when it comes to trying to read what's up here. Now I can stand all the way back here and still read what's on the, on the notes there. Um, but, um, and the other thing is, I'm uh, uh, shrinking. So I gave my iPad, no, I gave the, uh, uh, the MacBook Air to my daughter and cashed in my little iPad and picked up this. So now, no need to have the laptop. This does it all. It's as powerful as my laptop. So it's wonderful. Smaller is better. And uh, I'm trying more and more. I realize this, that um, days here and this world are, are limited. So I want to see how little I can leave behind, not how much I can collect in the next few years. It's been a real contest. <clears throat> but uh, I, I'd like for us to, to continue on in our series that we've been doing here on generosity. And speaking about uh, open hearts, open hands, and uh, the, the, the spirit of openness and, and desire to be sharing with others. <clears throat> so in doing this, I also need to just back up a bit. I am feeling miserable. I'm, I am in a cold sweat this right now. But uh, so I'm not going to shake your hands. I'm not going to hug you or kiss you or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll keep our distance, but um, uh, we'll see how we can we can uh, get through this. Last uh, the last two days, I've just had this cold chill. I think there's some kind of flu going around. Isn't there a measles uh, thing going on in Seattle right now? Can't be, can't be affecting me. I've done, been there, done that. So, <laughs> also, not wearing a lavalier, so I can take the microphone away when I cough, and and uh, don't have to. You don't have to hear that. Anyway, uh, that's what it is. It's just what it is. <clears throat> For the last several weeks, we've been talking about generosity. We started out. A few weeks ago, about the wisdom of gen generosity, and I just want to give a bit of a, uh, a review on these things as we look at it and we see uh, how this can uh, impact us and what a difference it can make in our lives when we learn to be generous. And why is why do we talk about the wisdom of generosity? Because it's wise to be purposeful. It's wise to be intentional. To strive to be generous. We we learn this from looking at the wise men when they came to baby Jesus. They went to great effort to bring their gifts to Jesus, their um, abundance of gifts. It's wise that <laughs> we should be purposeful in our intention to be generous, but it's also wise for us to protect uh, a generous spirit. There are things that in our world today that really attack generosity. One of them is consumerism. Um, and Strange that I should talk about consumerism since I just bought this brand new iPad Pro, but um, I, I feel like it's uh, a work expense, <clears throat> or maybe it's just an old age expense. <coughs> but because of this world we live in, in which the new gadget, the latest gadget, is the thing that we want, we need to protect our, our, our spirit of generosity. It's, it's good because stories on generosity are so inspiring of people who have given much and sacrificed much in order that they can be a help and encouragement to other people. We talked about this wisdom of generosity, but then we also uh, delved into this matter of the measure of generosity. How much does it take to be generous? And it's not in an amount. You see, when that little boy went out to the mountainside because there was this... Um, itinerant preacher who had come there and gathered a crowd and uh, his mother had the foresight to give him a lunch to take with him. Little did he know that that lunch of five loaves and two fishes was going to be used <coughs> as an incredible example of generosity, feeding 5,000 people. But in order for that to happen, this is what I find truly um, speaks very highly of this little boy. In order for that to happen, he had to give up his lunch. Jesus says, you know, let, we'll use your lunch. We're going to give it all away. He, what hope did this little boy have of getting lunch? The men get fed first in those days. And they were all set out there, but uh, there was 12 bags of 
12 baskets that were left over, and so he was able to, uh, to get his lunch also. I, I say that to say this. When we talk about the measure of generosity, too often we like to look at the total amount, and it's not the total amount. Generosity is not to be defined by an amount. Generosity is not to be defined by some financial number. Generosity is a behavior. It's a belief. It's an open heart with open hands, whatever that amount might be. And I think the lesson that we can take from this is generosity is simply doing what we can do. It's amazing how many times we find ourselves restricted from doing anything because we, can't, we don't feel like we can do enough. It's, <coughs> excuse me, it's not how much. It's simply doing what we can do. And if we'll start doing that, it's just, and again, look at that little boy. He just had a little lunch. And he just did what he could do. He gave it away, and Jesus took it and magnified it. I think of the story quite often of the widow lady who when she went to the temple to give her offering, she only had two little pennies, a very insignificant amount in the large scheme of things. Compared to the large offerings that were given by others of great means, but it was all she had. She walked away from that offering plate with nothing left except this. Jesus saw what she had done. I, I'm disappointed that the scriptures don't tell us the rest of the story. That was the end of it. I'd really like to talk to that widow woman to see how, she, how her generosity, how her sacrifice came back to be a blessing to her. We'll find out someday. But in Jesus' economy, little is not only enough. Jesus, makes, turn, Jesus turns little into much. That's why we, when we speak about generosity, we don't want to speak about the amount. We want to speak about the spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then I'd like to look at the practice of generosity. We spoke about this a few weeks ago when... We were in uh, 2 Corinthians, and Paul was encouraging the, the church in Corinth to take up this offering. They had promised it before. He had talked about it before, and he said, I'd like you to prepare this offering that we're going to give to the church in Jerusalem that's suffering uh, quite a bit from a famine now, and, and that we can be a help to them. And so <clears throat> when we looked at this, we find out that here's a... Here's a benefit that God gives to us. And this is, this is especially true of us today. We, we, we don't experience poverty in our world like we used to. Now, hear me out. I'm not saying that there isn't poverty. There definitely is. I'm just talking about us as a community. Us as a, as a community... We might see occasional poverty, we might hear about it, we might read about it, but typically we don't have to deal with it here. We have a government that's fairly well off and takes care of its people, and uh, so we don't have that sense of the depth of poverty. We're fairly well off. I'm much better off than my parents and their parents, and their parents. There seems to be this trend, but what happens is we forget that. We take that for granted. We don't stop to think about it. And so there's a, there's a necessity that we have in our lives today to learn to be generous, to learn how to practice generosity. And this practice of generosity, it's a practice that God has given us, he's blessed us with, in, in order to experience the joy of giving, the joy of participating in others and, and, and helping others. And I just want, to, there's, there's three things I'd like for us to see in this practice because it's been ordained by God. It's incorporated in the laws of nature. He puts it like this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 says, the point is this. 
Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. This is a natural law. This is a law that was, it's, it's put into the fiber of our existence and of our world. It's, it's there. It's a law that has to do with the attitude of being generous. He also tells us this, that as a result of this law, there's, there's the, the response from it. The result from it is the great joy that we get to experience. The joy is, this is it's a truth about God. It is that God loves a hilarious giver. One who gives with an unfettered freedom. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, in this practice of generosity, he says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Pause. This is a very important truth that I want you to understand. I know that there are preachers all over the world who want to tell you how much you need to give. But let's read this again, okay? He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. You don't decide for me what to give. I don't decide for you what to give. You, <coughs> you decide according to your heart what you're going to give. And the requirements are this, not reluctantly and not under compulsion. I, I would say this is one place where we fail as Christians. We fail as churches. We have this idea of putting people under this guilt of, oh, you're not giving enough. You're not doing enough. You're not serving enough. Let each person decide, decide in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. But here's the catcher. God loves a cheerful giver. There it is. There it is. Man, I mean, if you're cheerfully going about what you're doing, God loves that. So I think the advice is this. You should be giving as much as you can cheerfully. As much as you can, as much as you can joyfully and, and happily. And if you can't give joyfully and happily, you know what? Don't. Don't. No matter what anybody says. Let God work in your heart. And, and realize this. He rejoices. He loves a cheerful giver. I think it would change, I think it would change a whole lot of the attitude, the, the general attitude towards Christian churches if we actually did this. A lot of people, a lot of their reticence to coming into a church or hearing some preacher or listening to some TV evangelist is they're afraid he's trying to get into their pocket. And you know what? They usually are trying to get into your pocket. So I think this is a wonderful verse. Whenever, whenever somebody's getting into your, into, trying to get into your pocket and say, you need to give some more, or they're trying to put you on a guilt trip, you need to be doing more. You need to be serving more. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Are you cheerful? Were you happy with your offering today? I'm just asking. <laughs> there should be a joy in being able to participate. Are you happy that you, you aren't in church every Sunday because you're teaching in Sunday school? Are you happy that you're giving up your Saturday evenings to be able to be a part of our WANA program? And if, you're, if it's a drag and you're reluctant, you're going, oh, gosh, do I have to do this again? Change your attitude or get out. God loves a cheerful giver. And then he follows this up with a promise. When this talking about the practice of generosity, he follows this up with a promise. <coughs> the promise is God lavishly and abundantly bestows upon us his infinite grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. 
To me, this is the best verse in the whole Bible. Um, some of you might argue it's John 3.16. That's good. I, I'll, I'll, I won't argue with you. But this is, this is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. I can't tell you how many times this verse has carried me through uh, difficult times. And God is able. We could stop right there. Just stop right there. We could stop just right there and reflect on, it doesn't matter where you're at, what's going on, God is able. He's able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. I just don't see what's left out there. That's a great promise. That's a fantastic promise. And he gives it to us, in this context of generosity. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about all what I can or can't do or want to or don't want to do. God is able. He's able to, his infinite grace to lavishly bestow it upon us. <coughs> which supplies in all sufficiency, in all things, at all times. Okay, you tell me, what's missing? God, did you leave anything out? All things, all times, all sufficiency, that you may abound in the occasional project, in every good work. That is a powerful verse. And fourthly, we looked at this, the blessing of generosity. Great living grows from great generosity. Augustine said, God is always trying to give good things to us, but our hands are too full to receive them, too full of our own desires, too full of what we see that this world has, too full of these consumerist items that we have to have, our lives just become too caught up in this that God can't give us these good things he'd like to us. And then Paul says, <clears throat> he tells us it's more, uh, he's quoting Jesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. He says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. <coughs> What are some of those blessings? Well, here's what a generous spirit will do for us. It'll protect us from being covetous, of wanting what somebody else has or wanting what we don't have. It'll protect us from becoming jealous and wanting other to, to be like somebody or to have what other, others have. And the thing is about this generosity, this great living, living generously. Living generously is learning to live by faith. Now, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> How many of us are actually living by faith? I mean, in actuality. Did it take any faith for breakfast this morning, if you've had it? And how much faith is going to be exercised about your lunch this afternoon? In our world today, we can live so automatic, so routinely, so easily, little exercising our faith. There's a, there's a blessing to be had in having an open and generous spirit and living on the edge. I have been living on the edge all my life. Well, all my adult life. My parents took good care of me. But there's something about living in a, in, in a situ, putting ourselves in a situation where we're actually living on the water. I mean, think about this. I can get it when Jesus walks on water. I mean, he's Jesus, right? But the amazing story to me <coughs> is when Peter says, Lord, bid me come to you. 
And Jesus says, according to the scriptures, one word, in uh, more than that in Chinese, but he just says, come, Baba, come. And old Peter jumps out of the boat. What in the world is in his mind when he does that? Everything he's ever experienced in his entire life goes completely contrary to the fact that he can jump out of the boat in the middle of the night and not sink. Right? Right? Who does that? Who has that kind of faith to do that? Is that the way that we live? When we ask God that we, for something and, and, uh, and he says, come on, let's do it. Let's go for it. And we begin to step into areas that we, we're just not familiar with. We just don't understand. And it's a step of faith. Many times we exercise this in our life too because <clears throat> we don't always uh, know We don't always know what's coming up tomorrow, right? And we have to take the next step by faith. We can all look back in times when we, we were very questionable about what's next. <clears throat> because living generously is learning to live by faith, is learning not to trust in myself, not to simply depend on my family or my connections, not to depend upon my bank account or my talents and abilities to be able to, <coughs> carry, to carry me through. And uh, this, is, this is a very uh, sensitive reality to me at this point. I never imagined, I never imagined that I would be where I'm at today. This is not something you can prepare for. And to be honest with you, <clears throat> it was very hard to get on the airplane to come back. I spent a week with my daughter and her family and those two grandsons. And then it was time to come back here. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining about being in Taiwan. I love Taiwan. I love this church. But it's that, it's that interaction. It's the relationship. It's hard day by day, trying to go through the activities of the day, trying to sort things out. It's a very sensitive reality. It's a faith-stretching experience. Last couple of days, I've just been miserably sick. I've been in bed with the chills, shivering, coughing, hacking, nobody to get me my honey tea. Nobody to, to uh, ask me how I'm doing. It's the new reality. When I was at my daughter's house, bless her heart, she says, Dad, here's what you need. She goes and gets the infuser and puts some oils in it, turns that thing on, lets it run all night long, and ah, I could breathe. I could breathe. It was wonderful. I come here and... No daughter to run, get the infuser, and put the oils in it for me. You know, it's just, it's the new reality. What I'm saying is this, though. I'm, I'm not regretful of living in Taiwan. I know this is where it's, I'm supposed to be. This is the ministry God has for me. And I love pastoring this church. But there's, in, in doing so, there's a stretching of faith, realizing that I really have to depend on God and God alone. But there's a blessing that comes from learning to live generously. That blessing is seeing how God works.
the actual hand of God. The blessing is learning to live by faith and letting faith stretch us and seeing how God uh, powerfully moves. Not always the way that we intend to do so. Now, <clears throat> last week, Pastor Dan Freeman preached. His title of his sermon was The Example of Generosity. And he spoke from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, talked about the example of what that was. And uh, in chapter, uh, chapter, seven, uh, chapter 8 there, he says, uh, Paul instructs the people there, he says, to excel in this act of grace also. How do we excel in the act of grace? the uh, grace of generosity. What does, <coughs> <coughs> what does that act of grace look like? And the example for us is our model, our teacher, our Lord, Jesus. Here's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pause for there for a moment. Um, <clears throat> I'm of the opinion that very few people really know grace, really understand grace. The concept, the idea of grace is so contrary, so formed, so counter-cultural uh, to our understanding. Everything in our life is based on merit. You get ahead in this life when you're able to succeed to certain levels and be recognized for the levels that you succeed to. Everything in our life, from the time we're children in our family and going to school, it's based on merit. Grace is not based on merit. It's very hard for people to get our minds around this. I had a, <coughs> I had a very long conversation with a Mormon uh, missionary in Utah, a friend, a good friend. Very long conversation. He knew about Jesus, knew about what Jesus had done for him, very much involved in the church and so forth. And he just said this. He says, I just can't get my mind around the fact that God does this by grace, that Jesus gives us his, his forgiveness without something on my part. There has to be something that I can do to merit that favor. I simply say to you this, we, 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 the, we talk so much about grace, we talk uh, about, uh, uh, we call ourselves Grace Church, we want to be gracious, but when we begin to delve into what grace is, do we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Paul says, positively, he says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, <coughs> that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Because I deserve it? No. Because he graciously gives us the gift of himself to us. That we might be saved through his mercy and his love. It's grace. Now I want... <clears throat> I was going to start preaching a sermon now. I'm not going to. I just want to see, I just want to read the scripture that we're going to look at next week. We'll read the scripture. I'll make a few comments on it. Then we're going to go home and I'm going to go to bed, okay? <laughs> so, I mean, that's just, that's just what it's going to be. Uh, turn your Bibles to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and we'll read the first uh, seven verses there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, it'll be up on... Uh, up in the screen in front of you if you'd like to follow along. Second Corinthians chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction... Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, 
and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Just a couple of things I'd like for us to take note of this in this uh, passage of scripture. Paul is talking about an offering that, he had at, that the Corinthian church has offered to collect for the saints in Jerusalem. He hasn't made this appeal or, or request of the church in Macedonia. They are in extreme poverty. When it talks there in, about extreme poverty, the word is sea bottom extreme. In other words, you can't get any lower than the poverty that they are in. So Paul didn't actually, <coughs> he wasn't going to put this burden on them of participating in giving to the church in Jerusalem. But they came to him. It's interesting. Paul's not begging them to give. These people are begging Paul. They're begging him and saying, let us participate. So in this particular passage, as he's going through this, he uses that word grace in um, uh, eight different times. In, chat, in verse 1, he says, the grace of God given among the churches. Verse 4, the favor of taking part of the, the relief. That's the same word there, as uh, the same Greek word, charis, uh, of, um, that's used above. And then uh, verses 6 and 7, he talks about this act of grace. Verse 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then three more times in chapter 9, he talks about the grace in relation to generosity and giving. He says, uh, in other words, the grace of giving is what this, these two chapters are all about. Paul's teaching on giving is a sermon on grace. And we, we need to realize that. And this is why he says it's not by compulsion it's, it's, it's not by uh, reluctance. It's a gracious thing. It's, it's something that we, we desire to do, not because it's merited, but because it's something that we can be a, that we can be a part of. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things. In verse 2, he says, For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. I read that verse over and over and over again. I'm thinking, that's a crazy verse. That, that's a, that's a, look what he says. First of all, he says, severe affliction. They're in rough times. It's not just difficult times. This is severe affliction. Next phrase is, there's their abundance of joy right next to extreme poverty, which has resulted in an overflowing of a wealth of generosity. It just doesn't fit. It just doesn't make sense. How do you put all this together there? Here is a group of people who are suffering greatly in their poverty. Paul describes it as sea bottom poverty. And, uh, but they said, we want to give. We want to participate. There's this desire that out of their extreme poverty, it results in overflowing to a wealth of generosity. This is how things work when we open up to a generous life, a generous spirit, a spirit of generosity. And then he goes on to say, <clears throat> in verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. 
begging us fervently. Again, there's something wrong. There's something wrong when, when churches are trying to beg people to give more to the offering. Paul says they were begging him. Can we participate? I, I think I've told you this story before. It was uh, Heritage Baptist Church in, um, in uh, Virginia. The pastor's name is Mike Edwards, a uh, good friend of mine. We loved hanging out together. And so he had me, actually, when, uh, when I made the commitment to become a missionary, he was the first one, the first pastor to come up to me. He says, uh, Dave, I want you to come to my church. I want to be the first church to be supporting you. And so when can you be there? Now, I live in California. He's out in Virginia. So that was a bit of, uh, uh, of uh, logistics involved. Went to his church there. And he asked me, he says, I want you to tell our church what you really need. Give us a big gift. We don't want to just buy you... Uh, some minor items. We want to give you a big gift. And I, I told you before that in Bible school, they taught us how to ask for money. I just, it just uh, didn't, I couldn't do it. And so I began to, to hesitate, and he, got, he buttonholed me. Mike came right up to me. He's, Mike's a pretty big guy. He came right up to me and says, hey, listen, Homer, I'm going to tell you something. Don't you fudge around with me, buddy. If, I, if I'm asking you for a big gift, I want you to tell me. You know why? Because if you don't, you are preventing us from being a blessing to you. And that means you're denying us a blessing from God. So bring it on. Well, that was a good lesson for me to learn, too. That, that he was begging me. He was begging me for an opportunity to give me something. Isn't that wonderful? I thought that was so refreshing. There was a <clears throat> another time uh, when, we, when we were talking about, uh, yeah, we, I was in a missions conference in Miami, Florida at Global Church. And uh, it's a Spanish church. The pastor there is Russell Johnson. He's a missionary kid who grew up in Peru. He is so Spanish he doesn't, uh, he doesn't even know it. He goes back and forth between Spanish and English like night and day. It doesn't, you know, it's just so natural. Um, a great church. So, <clears throat> now, you have to understand, I have a big family, had a big family, six children. He has us at his missions conference, and he has all the missionary families come in. He, he tells all the children to stand up front there. So all the missionary kids are standing up front there, and he tells his church now, okay, church, you know what to do. And here's what they did. It was kids all up there, the whole church stood up, and they came in, and they started filling the hands of these little kids with dollar bills till they couldn't hold anymore. He just said, stuff it in your pocket. Keep stuffing it in your pocket. My kids just, it blew them away. But they, what was so amazing was that the laughing and the joy in those people as they gave to those kids, and they saw the joy that they had there. And then Russell came up to me and he goes, Homer, let me tell you something. That money is not yours, buddy. <laughs> we'll take care of you later. And uh, my, my children have never forgotten that generosity there. This, this happened over and over again. When, when I was leaving Calvary Baptist Church, leaving my internship to begin uh, deputation as a missionary, I had a 1965, uh, it was a Chevrolet something, I don't even remember it didn't even have an air cleaner on it. It just, uh, it, it was an old, old car. And um, so I said, I don't know what to do about getting a car. And my pastor said, don't worry about it. They went out and bought a car from Hertz Rentals. It was a nice Chevy Malibu. Uh, I put 1,000 miles a week on that car for 16 months and never broke down at all. Uh, I, I say that to say this. When that church, at that service, when they gave me the keys to that car, there was such a joy and a happiness of, of being able to be generous like this. We get to experience that. That gets to be a part of us. And that's what he's talking about here, is about this church in Macedonia. Dirt poor, worse than dirt poor. They're poor, poor, poor. 
But they're begging Paul, please, let us be a part of this. Please, let us participate. We want to be a part of giving relief to our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. This is what Paul's speaking about as far as the, the spirit of generosity, the charis, the grace, the favor of generosity. And then he, he says this too. <clears throat> he talks about uh, the act of grace. Let this act of grace be yours. Don't, re don't uh, reject the others. In the last verse he says that you should excel in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness. Excel in these things, but don't leave off excelling in this act of grace, the act of being generous. It's a grace and a gift that comes from God and God alone. So I, I, I say to you again, church, I, I'm, I'm very privileged to be a pastor of a very generous church. I just want to encourage you that this is a wonderful way to live, a wonderful way to, to go. And the, the, the last thing there, <clears throat> there is a favor to be enjoyed in the midst of generous living. It shouldn't be something that's reluctantly done. It should be something that we do as a part of a joy in our life. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you... You graciously gave your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. You graciously, willingly gave your life that we might have life. And you became poor and poverty and lived in poverty so that we might have the blessings of everlasting and eternal life. You've given so very much. And you know, it's good to know that you didn't do so reluctantly. You didn't do so out of a sense of obligation. You graciously, mercifully poured out your love upon us. And now we have the opportunity to experience that same kind of joy of giving of our lives, giving of our resources, giving of our time, giving of the blessings, Lord, that you give us. Let us be large conduits that you can pour your blessings out into others, into other lives. I thank you, Lord, that uh, there is such a joy in being, in participating with you in this matter of generosity. In Jesus' name, amen.